Okay. Well, good morning. Um, huh. All right, I got, I got feedback already. This is good. So uh, it's more interesting for me if you guys, if you have any questions or you want to interrupt, just go ahead and do it. It's, 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 uh, otherwise, it's a long time for you guys to sit, I think. Uh, so just a brief background of who I am. So I work with, uh, like Don said, with USDA, ARS in Maryland. I'm an agricultural engineer. <clears throat> I work mostly on the production side of things. So I do plant experiments, and we also do some modeling work. And what I'm going to talk with you about today is sort of a broad umbrella for how all of, not just my research, but I think agricultural systems in, in one sense can fit underneath this concept of food security. I'm going to spend uh, probably almost a quarter of the time just giving a background information on what food security is. And then we're going to talk about different projects that are going on in the research area underneath this umbrella. Okay, so I, I think it should be interesting to everybody. Um, so. What I first want to talk about is what food security actually is. And this is going to mean different things to different people. And uh, it was actually the second definition, which I'll show you in a minute, that I was thinking of what food security is. But when I became part of this, pro this project, uh, a lot of the people who have spent their careers you know, kind of researching this had told me, well, really, the, one of the main versions of this, it's the ability of a country or a region to continually produce a significant portion of its staple foods. Okay, so in other words, it's the ability or a measure of how much product we're producing over how much we're consuming. Okay, so if you're producing uh, or you're matching almost what you're consuming in the region, then you could be one, by this metric, you could be more food secure. Um, some of the challenges, and I'll have a couple slides on this a little bit later, in our region that we do have this continuing loss of farmland, a lot of it's being converted into larger uh, industrial sized farms, which could be good or bad, but that, that the issue is we're starting to lose some of this farmland. And we have increased reliance on food outside of the region. So this means if we're growing less and we're consuming uh, the same or more, this metric is going to start to decline. Okay. Whether or not that's actually a bad thing, I, I don't know, but we'll talk about that too. The other definition, and I think this is what most people would think about food security, it's actually ensuring that people have adequate access to healthy fruits and vegetables and other types of, of foodstuffs. And in this project, we added on this, this uh, low-income community as part of the granting process. And so... Uh, by the way, a background, in our region, this is a 12-state region, 7 million have been uh, determined to be food insecure, which means they don't have access to healthy fruits and vegetables at an affordable price. Okay, and there are multiple reasons for this, but one of the issues is they do have access to food, but a lot of it is not healthy. Okay, so you have, you're starting to get dietary-related problems in a significant portion of the population in our area. And so you have all these diet-related diseases. So just kind of keep these two definitions in mind as we go through the rest of the, the lecture. Um, some more background information, and again, I hadn't really thought about this too much until I started this project, but uh, we think about a food system, and this really describes how we all kind of fit into the process, and this is a, a Wikipedia definition. So it's all the processes and infrastructure involved in feeding a population. Okay, so there's your food security connect connection. Growing and harvesting, and this is really where my specialty was, uh, processing, you know, outside the farm gate now, processing, packaging, transporting, marketing, consumption, and disposal. So you can think of this, all the commodities were going in the region, and from everything that's happening prior to farm gate to disposal would be considered a food system itself. Okay, so you can imagine different scales that are involved in this. I realize you probably can't see this diagram too well, but the idea is that it's just kind of a, a cyclical system. And if you were to try to kind of summarize this in easier terms, you can think of three different components. Okay, so you have production, which would be up to the farm gate, production of food, animals, whatever the commodity is the distribution or the infrastructure of how product is getting from the farm gate to market, and then consumption, access of households to purchase the food and then taking it home and, and cooking it or however they process it. Um, that food system is going to have different scales. Okay? And there's not really a great definition for what a food system scale is, but you can just think of it in simple terms. It's, it's the geographic boundary along or around your food system. And so obviously this could change if it was apples or if it was... Uh, animal protein or if it was uh, potato. Uh, so this is going to vary on commodity and there's lots of different scales to think of. And I, I should indicate there's no value judgment here. Okay, we're just, we're just laying out the facts, right? So the one that I think everybody is most familiar with is, is it's called global scale. It's also called corporate scale. And it's called corporate scale because a lot of the big agribusinesses are involved in different aspects of it. Okay, again, this is not a good or bad thing. It's just, it's just the way the reality is. 
Uh, this was back in 2002, so I imagine it's, it's changed maybe even greater, but the average American food item travels from 1,500 to 2,500 miles from farm to plate. I mean, that's, that's pretty incredible to think about. You know, where is our food coming from? Okay, again, there's no value here. It's just, it's just pretty amazing to think about that. Then you have the regional level, which is what we're going to focus on. And it really depends on who you ask what a region is. Okay? For our project, we define this as multi-state. And I'll explain why in the next couple slides. Uh, but one thing that can kind of help define this, too, is that it's more dependent on supply chains. And what a supply chain is, it's basically taking our definition of a food system for all commodities and focusing on a single commodity. Okay, so a supply chain for apples would be you know, the production from the, the trees at the farm to distribution to consumption. Okay. Or for potatoes, it would be a different supply chain. So it's just a smaller version of the food system. Um, so in a regional scale, you still have these supply chains happening. It's just happening within multi-state. As opposed to a local scale, and again, this depends on who you ask what a local scale is. Uh, I tend to think of this as being within state. Uh, it's within uh, 10 miles, maybe, from farm to consumption, maybe a little, a little bit bigger. But these consist, instead of supply chains, they're more direct sales, so directly from the farmer to the consumer, okay, whether it's farmer market or CSA or that type of activity. Okay. Any questions yet? Okay. Oh, yeah, good. On your global one yes. from 2002, do you think that number's changed at all? Yeah, it probably has. Whether it's gone up or down, I, I can't really say. I suspect it would go up. Um, and the reason is because it's the efficiency of scale. Right. You know, we'll talk about, I'll talk about that in the next slide, actually. But I, I suspect it has gone up. Yeah. It's funny because everybody refers to that paper and nobody's done any, any more yeah, updating on it. I suspect the local percentage is still small compared to the global market. But, yeah, and actually that's another hypothesis, right? That if, uh, if food security can be increased by regionalizing it, then we want to get away from that. Yeah. But it, it, in certain locations, that's probably your... your Assumption might be correct that it has dropped, but I think worldwide, it's, or at least countrywide, it's probably still the same. Um, so thinking about how this food is produced, and this is kind of independent of scale. We call this uh, industrial production. This is really what we think of as conventional. And again, it's not really scale dependent, okay? But you have, uh, and this is why these food miles are so, are so large, okay? You have sort of historically unprecedented production method where you're getting maximum food product for minimum dollar cost. Okay. And again, there's nothing wrong with this. I'm not suggesting there is. It's just trying to understand how food is, how we're getting our food. Uh, it is chemically intensive, so we're using lots of fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides for food production. And again, this is not scale dependent. Um, we have a large reliance on monocrops and single animal production facilities. Generally, not always, but these usually consist of large consolidated farms. So we've moved away from individual family-owned farms to, you know, corporate farming. Um, there are uh, growing papers now on awareness of impacts on environment, public health, and rural communities. Okay, whether that impact is greater than if you had went back to the older model of more multiple family farms, I don't know. Okay, that's one thing that people tend to not to talk about. Everybody assumes this is always a bad thing, but it's not necessarily the case. Okay. <clears throat> and again, this applies to all scales, not just global. So again, these are just some background things to kind of help frame the, the discussion later. Um, for, you know, my focus and what we're going to talk about, to, talk about today is this Northeast Seaboard Region. So I call this the NESR. And this is 12 states from Maine down to West Virginia. And so this would include Delaware and Maryland, of course. And kind of some historical observations and some current observations about this. This contains 23% of the U.S. population. Okay, so 12 states contain 23% of the population. Historically, it was a major agricultural production region for the country. Okay, it still is, but we're now importing 65 to 85 percent of our fresh fruits and vegetables are coming elsewhere. Okay, so this is that food mile, you know, the, the 1,500 to 2,500 mile average food to plate item. Okay. Uh, we still are maintaining large tracts of prime farmland, and I have some statistics on that. And in fact, a lot of this is not currently being used for, for production purposes, and we'll talk about that. But if you look at our food insecure definition, roughly 12% of that population is considered food insecure, despite this large natural resource base. Okay, again, these are just laying out the facts. Uh, thinking about our first definition of food security, it's been, di it's been uh, estimated that we're 24% self-reliance, which means we are basically, if the ratio of consumption to production, we're about 24% across all commodities, which means we're dependent, 76% of our food for everything has to come from elsewhere. 
And this is going to range on states. Some states are a little bit more self-reliant than others in the region. And that's one reason why we're looking at regional production as opposed to localized production. Okay, that you need to look at a multi-state production capacity because some states are more productive for some commodities than others. So why, uh, why do we think regionalized food production may actually help food security? Okay, and again, this is still all hypothetical. Most of the, the products that we're importing from elsewhere are from centralized production, whether it's California or it's from Mexico, or whether it's from China or other locations. That in itself is not necessarily bad, but it does lead to certain vulnerabilities. Okay, so most of that production is monocultures, and that increases your vulnerability to having a bad environmental year. Okay, a bad weather year can impact product availability and quality. You may also increase your vulnerability to pest and disease outbreaks. I mean, we hear in the, in the news about every two months there's something with salmonella or E. coli contaminating our lettuce or, or our melons or our cantaloupes. Okay, so that's one you know, issue that we may have with centralized production. Uh, we talked about these high food miles. And that, again, that in itself might not be bad, but you are dependent on distribution and infrastructure, and in, in, in particular, uh, fuel costs. So if your gasoline prices spike, that's going to impact the cost of your fuel. That's actually what got me involved in this project uh, back in 2008 is when we first started talking about this in USDA. Gas prices had skyrocketed to, skyrocketed to about $4 per gallon. Okay, and that was going to start impacting our, full, our food prices. And I think we saw that with milk and egg, or I think with milk, uh, it costs went up quite a bit. And that may have impact on quality. If we're shipping foods over long distances, it may not be as fresh as if you were getting it from the farm gate <clears throat> or from a day or two after the farm gate. Um, we mentioned the Northeast seaboard region has a very large population. Well, the population is still growing, and we have very broad demographics. So the, you know, the one concern is having availability of food, but also do we have the diversity of product to satisfy different cultures in our, in our region? Okay. Uh, we talked about this, land and farm availability. Uh, we have limited farms, but they're becoming larger and larger in size. And the thing that we have to consider is not just production. It's how we're getting our products from the farm gate to market and then ultimately to the, to the consumers. And then uh, maybe a little more controversial is we have changing climate conditions okay, in the region. And we'll talk about that as one of the, the last examples in the, in the lecture today. So any of these issues can further exacerbate these food security challenges in our, in our region. Okay, so th this brings me to this grant that uh, under a lot of the research I'm going to present is being done under. This is a USDA NIFA grant that we were awarded in uh, 2011. So it was a five-year grant. There were 22 co-PIs, and I'm one of 22. Uh, and we're now in year seven, so they like what we're doing. They keep giving us extensions on it. And uh, so this is kind of a hot topic, regional food security and how do we increase food production and that sort of thing is, is, uh, is becoming very important to USDA. Um, any, any questions on this before we move on? Okay. So the overall goal of the project, and again, if you guys have comments or protests or anything, just you can just shout them out. Okay. I don't know if you do have a protest. <laughs> Actually, maybe I don't want to hear protests, but uh, it's okay. I think it'll be more interesting that way. So um, aren't there thirteen states in the northeast? Uh, so okay. The, or the question was, are thirteen states? Actually, actually, uh, my pro I, this gets a little confusing. I have another funding source, and I include Virginia in my state. Uh, but for this project, we're doing Maine to West Virginia. Uh, and then we're going as far west as you know, New York and Pennsylvania. But we're not considering anything farther west than that. And farther south is like Virginia. Yeah. And I guess if you include D.C., that would be 13. But uh, yeah. I'm not sure if that was a complaint or a protest no, or a comment. Observation. An observation, yes. Yeah, that's good. Observations are welcome, too. Um, okay, so the overall goal of that, of that grant was to assess whether greater reliance on regionally produced food can address those food security issues. Okay, so it's always seemed to be assumed that food security can be improved with regional or a re-regionalization of food production, but it hasn't actually been tested, and that's kind of what we're trying to do. Okay, uh, we talked about the food system, and I said there are, an easier way of kind of diagnosing it is into three different categories. So you can think of terms of production, what's happening up to the farm gate, distribution and processing from farm gate to the markets, and then consumption from markets to the households. Okay, my focus has been on production, and that's mostly what we're going to look at today. Um, so we're going to look at the production capacity in our region, and then one, one type of scenario evaluation at the end we'll, we'll talk about. And so that was kind of a really lengthy set of background information. And now I'm going to get into what we're actually going to focus on as, as far as topics or objectives. So our overall goal from a production perspective is try to develop and understand 
the productive capacity in the region. And that's kind of what I hope you guys can take home. You, you probably already know a lot of this anyway, but at least that's what I hope you can kind of take home from after listening to me is some, a better sense of how land is classified and what produ production estimates are uh, in the Northeast Seaboard region. <clears throat> so we talked about food security and the background. Uh, we're going to talk about current land classification and use. We'll talk about uh, production estimates and how it relates to regional self-reliance. Uh, how to op evaluate options for increasing that self-reliance. And then we'll look at some sensitivity to external factors and I use climate change as an example. Okay, so our first topic is going to look at land classification and use for those 12 states. Yeah. Um, okay, so these are some of the historical trends, and I, I think this is, is kind of sobering. Uh, since 1929, the land base in the region has declined nearly 60%. Okay, I guess the good news is it has plateaued since 1970, but to put it in perspective, uh, nationwide the decline was only 7%. Okay, and a lot of that is because of intense population growth in our area and a movement more to industrialization and urban development. The relative proportion of that loss occurred in the New England states. Okay, that was a 70% uh, decline in farmlands and a 60% in croplands, and I'll explain the difference in the next couple slides. So again, there is a you know, state to state difference in the region how agriculture is being transformed. Um, from an absolute acreage, value, Pennsylvania and New York had the greatest losses, but they still are the two largest productive regions in the area. Almost 60% of uh, land and farms is in those two states. Okay, so still tremendous agricultural capacity. And this is uh, also really interesting. It's not just that land was reverted to development. A significant portion, and we'll see some of these distributions, went to woodlands. Okay, so, and it, it may not be, someone asked me in the earlier lecture, uh, was this because uh, the land was just not maintained or was abandoned? And in some cases, there were subsidies for it. Uh, in some cases, land might not have been that prime. Maybe there was uh, uh, really steep slopes or the soil quality wasn't that great. But in other cases, it was just too, uh, too expensive to maintain. And so a lot of that land could potentially put back into production if that's a, if that's a, a goal of the farmer. This is looking at the current distribution of land and farms in the US and in our region. Now, land and farms is a USDA, USDA definition, and so it also includes these woodlands, it includes barns, and it includes ponds, and probably some other things that I'm, I'm forgetting off the top of my head. But it gives you a sense of anything that would be classified as a farm would be in this, this category. And I have to apologize because I left this in hectares because I have to keep going back from metric to English. But if you multiply that by two and a half, it gives you a sense of the, the acreage. But um, so land and farms in the Northeast is about 25 million acres, okay? Compared to the U.S. as a whole, the percentage of land within the Northeast is about 21%. In the U.S., it's 41%. Okay, I was pretty surprised to see. I mean, so, I mean, that tells you in proportion that there's much less land and farms in the Northeast, but whereas in the U.S., it's almost, you know, getting closer to 50%, uh, which actually is higher than I uh, expected. If you were to subdivide that in terms of cropland, okay, this is another USDA definition. So cropland includes items that are for direct human consumption. So some, some grains, it includes uh, pulses, vegetables, fruits, oil crops, and for some reason, the USDA included uh, tr Christmas trees and ornamentals also. So they're not for food consumption, but it inc it's included in the statistic, okay. Uh, so this is about six, maybe six million hectares. Uh, and as a percentage compared to the U.S., we're about 4.5% of land base versus 6. So this is actually a little bit closer for cropland. Okay, but still, if you remember, we're importing like 65 to 85% of our fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay, so we just keep that in mind as far as this uh, self-reliance issue. <clears throat> I have some graphics to come explain this a little bit better. Um, okay. So out of all those lands and farms, 65% contributed directly to the regional food supply. Okay, that means about 35% were shipping all the products outside. One half of that 65% were devoted to livestock feed. Okay, and we'll, I'll show the graph in the next slide, or the, the graphic in the next slide explains this better. 22% of that 65% was woodland not pastured, which means it's not in production. Like I mentioned earlier, Maybe that could be put into production if that's a goal, to try to increase regional uh, production basis. Okay, that was something that has to be explored. 8% of that 65 is for food production in cropland. Okay, and now here is the non-food production. This is where we have uh, things like crop failure, fat land that's fallow, land that's set aside for conservation, nurseries, Christmas trees. That's another 8%. So 16% would be that definition of USDA cropland. And one thing that gets confusing with these numbers is depending on what database you look at, you can get different results. 
Okay, but that, this is reasonably accurate. This is from 2010, I think. And so those numbers fluctuate from year to year, but that's probably still consistent today. And there's a large variation across the states for each of these categories. So again, this is why we're looking at regional instead of local food production uh, security issues. Everybody good? Okay. Yes? If 22% of the 65% were woodland, not pastures, how does that 22% contribute directly to the food supply? It's not. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's the easy answer. It's not. It could, potentially. If, if, if that land is um, not so marginal that we can grow more commodity on it. So is it not part of the 65 or it is? So it is. So it is, but it doesn't contribute. Ah. It's farmland. Yeah. It's farmland. It's not property. That's actually a good question. 2276. It must be, uh, we should change that to directly or indirectly. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't add up, yeah. Um, it, but, but the number still stands. So if you, if you have 65% of those total, actually, no, I don't know. That's a good question. Now I think about that. I'll have to find out. Actually, I think what it is is it's yeah. land that's part of a farm, but it's not crop land. Not crop land. Right. What, what the, right what, actually, that seems, that's a pretty low number. Yeah. Uh, I'm surprised it's that low because in my town that, it work, that I work in, it's about one for, there's about, for every acre of crop land, there's uh, an acre of not You see even more. Now, I have a, I'll show you, um, I think two slides from now, I have uh, some pie charts looking at that. And one, that's one of the things that surprised me. There's actually a lot more forested land that has not been, that some of it's it conservation, but yeah, and this is the thing. When I was putting this together, I got, I got a couple different information sources, and they all kind of conflict with each other. Um, so kind of bear that in mind, but I, <laughs> I don't have an exact answer for that. But it, this gives you an idea, anyway, of how things are distributed. And it may be, and I think one of the issues that John went the cap on, that um, uh, there's large differences from state to state, and even from county to county, with that, and we're, we've seen that in this project. So. Yeah. I'm yeah. Just wait till you two slides and see if it gets answered. So okay. Yeah. You can't ask me any more percentages. Don't ask me why they don't add up. <laughs> well, what's happened in a lot of places is, as especially where you don't have really large commodity production going on, as what happens is the the, the marginal crop land has been allowed to go. Revert to, revert. Uh, to forest mm -hmm. in, in a lot of places. Yeah. That's actually, uh, especially, like in Southern Maryland, we have a lot of tobacco production. Uh, a lot of that tobacco land is now, is now grown just up. Just grown up, yeah. 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 And it's still considered marginal land or prime land? or. Well, it's, <coughs> it's, it's, it's marginal in the sense that it takes more inputs to make it productive. Make it productive, yeah. Yeah, so we actually, and I'll show you towards the end, we have a slide kind of discussing some of those issues that if we were to put some of these uh, marginal lands into production, what could be the expected yields off of that? And you're not going to, obviously, the, the most prime land is already in production, right? So if you start putting these increments of less productive land, you should expect to see some of the productivity tail off. And the question is, do we want to do that? Um, yeah. Any more conversation on that? Okay, let, let's, uh, we're going to continue this topic in the next couple slides, too. So this is taking, this is all 100% of USDA definition of farmlands. Okay, so now these percentages should add up. Okay. So this biggest chunk here is land and farms that's not in production. So this would include the woodlands. This would include things like barns and ponds for some reason. This is about, across all 12 states, all counties, this is about 37%. Then you've got, uh, I guess, roughly another 50% is animal feed and foraging. Okay, pasture land, uh, grains for, uh, for animal feed, and forages, grass seed for animal feed. The smaller box here is what we're calling this direct human consumption, and this is what's can really considered cropland. Okay, so this is about 15% over here. So this kind of gives you a more graphical feel for how land is distributed currently among the 12 states. Okay, and this is what I mentioned, uh, at least from a forested perspective, things that maybe are not in farm but are forested, you can see the percentages. So this is not woodland uh, in farms, but this is showing just forested land. And whether this is conserved land or otherwise, I'm not sure from this distribution. But this is the 12 state aggregated value. And so 63% of all land area in our region is farmland, uh, sorry, is, uh, is forested, okay, by USDA definitions. You have 22% that's land and farms, which doesn't include the cropland, which is another 7%. And only 8% is developed. Okay, I was kind of surprised to see that. Okay. 
Now, and this is where you start to see the state-to-state -the -state differences. So here's Maryland and Delaware. And the big, uh, well, actually, one of the commonalities was the developed percentage land is almost the same, 19 or 20%. Um, there's much more cropland in Delaware, about half of that in Maryland. But the land and, the land and farms plus cropland is uh, it's a, little, a little bit bigger in Delaware also. Okay. So you can start to see some differences. And then when you look at states like New York and Pennsylvania, these are almost identical in terms of forested land. Okay. So again, there's differences from uh, state to state and how land is currently, uh, I guess, distributed, if you will. Okay. So that, that gives a sense of current land distribution. And then we're going to talk into what talking to now what the uh, productivity is on that those parcels of land. Okay, any any questions on that before we move on? Okay. Okay, so um, these are again are from a variety of different databases and from one of my colleagues at uh, Tufts, uh, Tim Griffin. And so our region produces over 100 food crops annually. Okay, from that vegetables represent 41 percent of that crop production. Okay, and then these are different rankings for oils, uh, fruits, grains, sweeteners, and, and pulses. Okay. Dairy and egg production accounts for more than 70% of all consumption. And most of that is being actually produced in New York, Pennsylvania, and we know Maryland and Delaware. Okay. So again, thinking about you know, regional self-reliance, that's quite a bit of product that's being uh, produced and consumed. So we think we've got higher reliance for those two, those two products. And we'll show some slides on that. And uh, in fact, and this is kind of interesting, if you were to take the pr proportion of production of dairy, eggs, chicken, lamb, and vegetables, it's generally higher uh, in comparison to its farm, farm area availability compared to the rest of the country. Okay, so in a relative sense, we're producing much more per unit area for those commodities than elsewhere in the country. But of course, that means we're producing less other things. Okay. But because we have um, about 22% or 23% of the US population, that per capita share is a bit lower. Okay. So we actually would need to grow more of that to make up for that difference in population. And anyhow, kind of the, the take home message is there's a relative strength and specialization in the region for different commodities. And that's, again, why we need to look at different uh, states as part of the regional perspective and not the local. Okay. So this concept of self-reliance varies according to product. And now here are some proof, uh, proof in case, I suppose. <clears throat> so these are regional self-reliance estimates for different commodities. And this is a very simple calculation. It's just the amount of product produced in those 12 states divided by how much is being consumed times 100. So you're just getting simple percentages. And this is from, I think, two years of, statistic, of, of uh, production statistics. So you mentioned fluid milk and eggs are pretty high. So it's over 70% for both. So that's pretty self-reliant. But then we start to decline looking at other uh, protein sources. So shellfish is under 50%, uh, and then meats are about 23%. And you can see the various breakdowns for different, different types of protein. And uh, in fact, again, this comes from Tim. Uh, sometimes it's useful to see the actual numbers. So this is millions of pounds produced per year. Okay, and you can see how chicken or poultry is vastly outweighing these other, other uh, protein, protein sources. And if you were to look at from a, a fluid milk basis, that were 75% self-reliance for dairy, okay, so we talked about earlier. So that was for protein sources from an animal basis. If we look at other categories, so for, for fruit production, we're about 18% uh, self-reliant there. Uh, one of the higher ones is berries. So strawberries is still a pretty big industry, uh, although I guess we lost a lot of ground in California and Florida. Um, people were talking about melons this morning, and that's about 13, only about 13%. And again, these aren't necessarily bad things. It's just kind of putting uh, some metrics that we can use to look at how much we're producing versus consuming in the region. Uh, grains, pulses, and oils are all underneath 10%. And you know, in general, we're, our reliance estimates are higher for animal versus plant-based foods. Okay. And then for vegetables, we're about 26%. And that jives with what we talked earlier, that we're importing somewhere between 65 and 85% of our fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so you have dark green, like uh, spinach, is about 11%. A uh, starchy crop like potato is about 33%. Red and orange would be like squashes, about 13%. And other commodities, about 33%. So these are all fairly low. OK. So if our objective is to increase self-reliance, then we want to know how can we increase our production in the region. And that's what we're going to explore in the next couple of minutes. Uh, any questions before I move on? OK. Well, that's good or bad, but that's, that's uh... Oh, yes, go ahead. Is there a specific region that's more self-reliant? 
Oh, that is a good question. I don't know. Uh, I, yeah, there has to be. We have not. Um, at least I haven't. I should say other, other people in this project might have. Uh, that's actually a good question. I don't know. If we're under, somebody's over. Yeah. Unless everybody's so dependent. Uh, 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 you know. Same thing we talked about in the other room. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I suspect, you know, California's probably got to be closest to 100% for a lot of their, they're, not, they're exporting everything, right? Um, yeah, they're exporting yeah. Florida, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great, yeah, and actually, so one of the things we, this uh, focus more on the distribution stuff, but we were trying to figure out, you know, some of the commodities we are, we, are, we do export quite a bit, some of the beef and some other, and, and milk, and uh, exactly what you had mentioned, other areas are sort of deficient, but there maybe have a net exporter of other products. And is it, can you start looking at more nationwide how these supply chains would start to connect? And there's, is there a way to refasten it? And it gets really complicated stuff. But that's a great question. I don't, I don't have a good answer. I don't have a solid answer for that. Yeah. But that's part of, you know, there are, this particular grant, uh, there were different regions that got these NIFA grants. And so there was, uh, Southeast got one, and, and so I assume they're all working on that stuff, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Any more Comment or discussion on that? Okay. Okay, good. So uh, let's go ahead and look at different production options. And one thing I should point out that we are, you know, to a certain extent, we are academics in my, my area. And so uh, that kind of gives us the freedom to explore certain things without having any, to a certain extent, no real world uh, constraints on that. And we recognize it. But you need to kind of start from the academic perspective and then you start putting in the constraints back in and it gives you a sense of what potentially could be done. And now we start putting in realities into there and try to figure out what could be done. Okay, so that's kind of where we're on the borderline of this with this type of, this type of study. So the first thing we looked at is, well, how is this stuff linked to diet? Okay, and this is work that uh, Chris Peters over at Tufts was working on. And so he took, uh, and very simple, um, we don't need to go into all these boxes, but if you have a certain diet in mind, you can kind of calculate how much, or how many different commodities and the mass of those commodities you would need to support that diet. And once you knew once you know what types of commodities you needed, you could then figure out, based on kind of land efficiencies, how much land area would be required. Okay. And once you have land area required, and then you need to know how many people are using that diet, you can figure out what the capacity is to feed people. So that's kind of a, an algorithm for how Chris did his work. And uh, so here's an example where he explored the amount of acres of different types of land classification needed to support different diets. So this is uh, the browns is, is cropland, the greens is uh, perennial cropland, and then grazing land is in the uh, kind of this tan color. Excuse me. And um, as you go from left to right, you can see the differences in kind of land requirements. So he started with a completely vegan diet, so no animal products whatsoever. And I, I don't know, to be honest, I don't know exactly how Chris calculated some of these. Uh, but the suggestion is that if you had everybody doing a vegan diet, you'd be about a, much less land base. Okay. And then as you go from left to right, you start increasing the uh, beef preference content. And in general, you start to have uh, more land requirements to satisfy the diet. So this is kind of, uh, I guess I could say it's intuitive. This is, this is kind of well known, but Chris is actually able to put some numbers to this as, term, as far as the land carrying capacity. And if you were to take this a step further, uh, Chris put this in a spreadsheet, and uh, the idea here is not those same exact diets, but the, uh, the, USDA, the USDA has some recommended dietary composition, for lack of a better word, and so what Chris did is looked at different percentages of those recommended values. And then he assumed that, assuming land area was fixed to satisfy that, that, um, those diets, he then looked at what the, what the satis how many people you could satisfy in those uh, categories, depending on diet. So, if you started going from, from where we are today to 100% recommended, you can slightly increase how many people you can feed 100% with that information without changing any of the land base. So what this kind of tells us is diet makes a certain impact, okay, but you still will need to add more land into production if you were trying to increase maybe 100% self-sufficiency. And again, like you guys brought up, that might, not be the, that might not be the smartest goal. right? That's a hypothesis we want to test, but it may be that uh, we want to focus more on trying to optimize our exchange from different regions as far as uh, in, in, imports and exports. Did you, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I this, and I'm not sure how you get at this, but there's a certain amount of land that, for example, is only suitable for grazing. Uh, it's not really suitable for crop production, yeah. uh, especially row crop production, conventional kill, all that. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there is there any way to get at that, because obviously, 
you can produce protein on something that's not suitable for crop production, that changes these numbers a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, and I don't, I mean, we have, a, I'll show you in a couple slides. We have one example, which is a, a bit coarser, where we look at productivity on those marginal lands. But there's still a lot of assumptions there that if something's marginal, how do you screen it? If, if it really can't grow a crop in there, how do you screen that out? And so that's where we sort of have this kind of academic level. And then we have to keep kind of parsing down our predictions till we get more and more realistic constraints on them. Um, but that, that's one thing we wanted to explore is can you start taking some of these marginal inputs of land and grow a uh, crop for direct consumption on. And, you know, for Chris's project, we didn't, he didn't look at that. But that's one thing that we want to start looking at as part of this project. Yeah. Did that answer your question? I don't, yeah, sure. I think so. Okay. Uh, we, we, actually, let me go in the back and I'll come back to you. Yeah. Baltimore County, Maryland, yep. were top in the country because you had two major metropolitan areas. They produced everything was local. Right. You know, local is all the phrase now, but we were always local yeah. until about the nineteen late sixties and seventies. Yeah. Same thing in New Jersey with the poultry. New Jersey yeah, had a huge chicken. Yeah. 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 Every county had their specialty and they did it and they swapped and moved this stuff all around locally. And it was much you know, you the stuff wasn't coming in from California, but now that you can fly stuff and right. <laughs> yeah, that's you a good point. All these 18 billion little small, I mean, it was one step above subsistence farming in many yeah. cases. Yeah. No, so we haven't, I mean, you, I'll show you some other slides where we started looking at um, classi classifying rural, urban, and the space between as peri urban using today's uh, geospatial distributions. Um, so, yeah, historically, I mean, the, I guess the issue would be now is that the land base has changed and the, infra the distribution infrastructure has yeah, changed. Yeah, you don't have the distribution because right. you used to have local creameries, local cameras, right. all this stuff that you right. could then get, you know, you had a place to take it. Yeah. Right, you can grow the fresh vegetables, but you can't get a can. And, and that's actually, yeah, and that's actually, <laughs> right, and that's actually a really big issue with, with meat production. And meat production. There's only, there's very few slaughtering facilities, yeah. you know, in the, in the region. Um, so, you know, I guess part of it is we're aware of some of these things, but we can't, we've got to put the umbrella on summer. But that's excellent, yeah, excellent, excellent point. Did, did you have? What's the, what's the overall goal? I mean, if you, it's great to find this stuff out and, and do right. it, but it, are you more motivated by like a doomsday scenario? No. Have to be no. self-sufficient? No, 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 no. the diets of people? Or so the, uh, the overall goal for this project was, yeah, there's always this assumption that if you can improve regional self-reliance, you can improve food security. And so we're trying to really test if that's, if that's actually the case. So what we're looking, actually, that's a good question. I, I didn't spend enough time on this. So what we are doing is looking at, is, you know, so I've been focusing on the production side, but there's other teams in the grant that are looking at getting that production through these distribution hubs to market, looking at seasonality issues, and then we have people that are looking at consumption patterns. And so we were tracking like 10, 10 bread basket commodities, like potato, wheat, uh, apples, broccoli through the region, a couple others. And uh, looking at tracing where the products are coming from, as far as not just the distributors, but also the farm gate, where, if they're coming from within the area. And then interviewing people in the consumption stores, in the, cons in the actual so stores throughout some of the major cities in the Northeast. What are they actually buying? What do they have available? And so really, in a sense, what we're doing is more fact finding. So a lot of the production stuff is kind of what if we can improve production? And then ultimately what we're trying to do is link this with distribution models, models that can tell us if we're able to get more of these products into the local stores, are people going to buy them? And if, if yes or if no, why or why not? And if the answer is yes, they are going to buy them, then we can start to look at, well, is this really increasing their security? And so this is kind of, in a sense, it's almost like a precursor project that we're trying to look at, is it actually... Uh, you know, feasible to do this. And then we can start trying to see what kinds of policies or uh, decisions will we need to make to try to force more regionalization happening. Yeah, so I'm not sure if I'm exactly answering your question, but it's, it's spot on. I mean, that's... You're just trying to basically stabilize the price. I mean, that, and I wasn't talking to Doomsday, like, into the world. Yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah. Doomsday, yeah. you know, uh, cost of whatever goes up. 
Right. Like, or, now we can't get it because other people are paying that. And, and it's not even just price. It's sometimes it's just uh, availability. Right. You know, certain commodities, for whatever reason, just aren't making their way into the grocery shelf. But I will tell you, uh, one of the findings from the consumption group was that in a lot of cases, it's not that urban people don't want or they can't afford a healthier product. They choose not to get it. And that was a pretty significant finding because the assumptions have been the other way around. You're looking at the change of what people want. Yeah, so, so, so right, right. Exactly. So how do you, yeah, yeah. So that's a whole other discussion that I'm not really equipped to handle. <laughs> handle. But it's it's a education. It's a dietary discussion. It's a, it involves cultural and social aspects, and and uh, yeah, that's that's uh, spot on. Uh, any more? I'll go ahead and ask. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. A lot of the premise here has to do with. Uh, I guess we've had 10 years of people looking at food, and when you talk about your USDA definitions of which land to use for what, mm -hmm. you're also looking at certain market baskets and certain food influences that a USDA has to do with fresh vegetables and a lot of that idea, whereas if you change some of that criteria parameter to say, hey, canned goods, you've got food, but it's not this specific one that somebody has decided is healthier or that we need to look at that item mm -hmm. per se, I think a lot of your numbers would we'll change. Yeah. change. And back to what was just being yeah. talked about, I had a friend several years ago who had large contracts with a local food store for sweet corn. He went in one day and they said, oh, by the way, we don't need your sweet corn anymore because we're getting a nickel cheaper. Mm -hmm. I like Mexico or somewhere. Right. So immediately it's, it's price dependent a lot of times. And regardless <laughs> of who's coming through the door, who wants what, a lot of those other influences are going to yeah. be influencing yeah. the market. But what you're choosing to look at in terms of deciding if somebody is food deficient or 70% or some number that you throw out, you know, that there's these land, food, desert type mm -hmm. ideas aren't necessarily as real as just saying, oh, well, we're looking for fresh broccoli or something. Right. You know, but to me, it's not as real as saying, hey, do they have enough meat? Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, so there's so many angles to that. So. From the production side, we're looking at, you know, fresh production. <clears throat> but then the distribution, we've got some members. So if we're tracking like 10 commodities, say, and so you've got uh, so many fresh peaches being grown or something, then certain, you're going to have different areas, where the, whether it's going to be consumed for fresh or for canned or for frozen, that has to get taken into account, right? That's part of what you're saying, I think. And then so it's not just the product you're grown, but how it's being processed. And that changes the supply chain structure for it. And so the distribution group is looking at some of that. But you're right, it's much more complicated than what we can, what we can talk about here. Yeah. And this is why this kind of research is really hard to make any grounds on. And that's one of the neat things about our project is I don't know that there's too many other people that are looking at it. Um, yeah. Well, let me, let me uh, move on. This, I mean, I hate to squash the discussion because this is really good. But let me take about five more minutes, and then we can open up to more uh, comments or questions after this. Um, Okay, so we talked about diet as one option, and what we're seeing is if you can't increase enough, uh, you can't really increase your self-reliance too much just changing diet, so there's other options we have to look at. And this is kind of where my own research comes in. So uh, one way is to, if you don't have more land you can put into production, um, can you increase production per unit land getting higher yields? And so things like changing your management, or looking at different management options, looking at different cultivar selection, or even different crop selection may be options that we have to look at. Uh, converting cropland. So maybe we want to reallocate crops to optimize reliance. Okay, this gets a little, a little uh, dicey because now we're actually, maybe from a higher up level, telling people what they should or shouldn't be growing in the region. Okay, and this, but this would involve multi-state uh, collaboration as far as maybe some states are more efficient at growing some commodities than others, and so maybe we're better off trying to optimize that. Okay, again, this is you know, thirty thousand feet looking down level. Okay, but just getting some ideas across. <clears throat> and then, of course, we talked about this as converting land. Unused lands and farms, recovering some of the lands that were in woodlands, this whole marginal versus prime land discussion. Okay, so the next couple of slides are going to kind of talk about this. Um, I guess I already kind of defined this, but uh, and I think this picks up on some of the conversation we had earlier. That we're, I've got a colleague, uh, Michael Kennard, who's at Columbia, and he's looking at the space between urban lands and rural lands. And this is called prairie urban. 
And so this is just kind of a zoning map. This happens to be for Baltimore. And he's, he's done this for several other cities in the region. And if you were to overlay this with different agricultural related industries, okay, you can see the yellow dots here are agricultural production sites. And then you've got these other dots here for processing, wholesale, retail, and storage. And the idea here is this is where our infrastructure is. Okay, so if we were going to grow more commodities in the area, other sites within this kind of peri-urban zone that we can do that. And also, I think the conversation came up earlier, you know, we need to understand where the distribution network is if we really want to try to more realistically increase our farmland and, and more crop production. And then Michael went ahead, and this is uh, for all area in the 12 state region, this is how it's zoned for different types of agricultural production, or agricultural uh, parts in this food supply chain. And so you can look at the grays where these peri-urban peri zones are distributed. Okay, so again, this gives us a sense of how things are currently distributed. And we may be able to use this information to kind of understand uh, where more lands are available for production. Okay, this is a, kind of addresses some of the topics we had earlier, some of the questions we had earlier. Um, and again, the, the, the numbers are only so good as the USDA databases. Okay, this is from the NRCS. And so they use something called a National Crop Commodity Productivity Index, okay, NCCPI. And what this, is, what this does is it relates the yield, kind of in a normalized sense from zero to one, with one being the highest value, uh, based on the textural properties of the soil and water holding capacity and organic matter and slope. And, and not surprisingly, as you start adding more marginal lands into production, you can see your yield will start to taper off. Okay. So this is kind of where we could, and this was done, uh, one of the tough students, Ashley McCarthy did this for, for the state of New York. But they're looking at this on a county by county basis and trying to see if you were to take some of these lands that were classified as marginal, what could you grow on those lands and how would that affect your production capacity? Okay, so again, this is looking more at a, you know, a 30,000 foot elevation looking down on a food security perspective. Okay. Uh, the last thing I'm gonna talk about, uh, just in a couple more minutes, is um, what about system shocks to food, food production? Okay, so, one thing I've worked on is looking at climate change as an example, but you could think about this, if you could do this uh, for a fuel price shock, or you could do this for a different management type operation, or you could look at it as a pest and disease impact. Okay, this happens to be an example for climate change because it's a little more, maybe controversial, a little more dramatic. Uh, but looking at using uh, biophysical models to simulate crop development and yield, they basically work on an hourly basis throughout the entire growing season. So they take inputs for genetic environment and management, and they ultimately, can simulate uh, yield, yield production. And if we take that information, and there's always now available digitally uh, geospatial databases. So we have 30-year uh, historical weather data that has daily information that we can use. We have uh, detailed soil, physical soil properties that are 16-meter resolution throughout the contigu contiguous US. And then we have information on how land is currently being used to grow different commodities over the last couple of years. And so if we take that and, and set different uh, units to do the models on, we can get an estimate of yield based on different um, varying inputs. And so I'm not going to get into detail. I'm not a climatologist, but we looked at some of the potential climate change impacts for end of century in the region. And this is just showing you the impact for potato. These are sort of like nightmare situations. There's no adaptation involved, OK? So even simple things like planting dates can make a big impact. But if you looked at potato, if we combine both rain-fed and irrigated management, which is the case in the, in the Northeast for potato, the impact would be 50%, which is really significant. But I will tell you, I've played around with this, and we've looked at things like changing planting date, and that reduces that impact to about 25%. Okay, that's still pretty significant, but you can imagine, we're now we're gonna be looking at different varieties and different other strategies to change that. Uh, for corn silage, uh, the impact is not as great. It's about 16, 16%. Again, simple things like adjusting planting dates can be down to about 11%. And then not all is always negative. Uh, for something like winter wheat, you can actually increase yields by up to 50%. Okay, so this is an example of how we can start using our data to look at um, different kind of shocks to the system and study good or bad what the impacts could be on availability of, of, of commodity production. So I think uh, this is really just a synopsis of what we talked about. So I think I'll stop here, and if there's more discussion, we can talk about it now or... If not, I'll let you guys go. But go ahead. It just seems like the drivers for enhancing food security aren't there. We've been talking about this since the 70s, since yeah. we got past that. The Green Revolution, yeah. Period in our history. We thought 
we were going to run out, run out of oil. We thought the price of oil would be too much. Um, we thought water would be limiting. And it should, it, it is, but it's not driving these regional systems to be more sustainable. Yeah. So, so what? So, okay, <clears throat> I have a talk this afternoon that focuses more on that. The big issue is going to be worldwide is population growth. And can we increase our food production to satisfy that population growth? And that's more a global discussion. But the issue is going to be land use, land availability, because there's only so much more crop it seems like it can squeeze per drop. But I will say a lot of stuff is, there is a lot of doom and gloom, because it seems like we've always been able to adapt to these issues. But there's kind of a growing consensus that we've already plateaued. If you look at, and I've got some of these graphs this afternoon, if you look at the increase per unit area over the last 30 years, really since the Green Revolution, it's been pretty linear, but it's now starting to plateau in most of the developed countries. And that means we've already, are we already hitting our maximum production potential for a lot of these commodities? And that may be okay, except that now we've got these large predictions of population growth. And so that's where I think a lot of these issues are gonna be coming, that if we can't provide more land, we're gonna be in trouble. And that's where a lot of the, the scientific consensus is on. But yeah, you're right. I mean, at some point, we keep having these same discussions and, you know, what do we do? And I think that's where the gentleman's point over here, these two guys were talking about, maybe we can't, maybe self-reliance really isn't the goal. Maybe the goal is to figure out how do we more optimize our regional system with either the Midwest or the Southeast or in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, that's where the focus needs to be to more optimize who's growing what and how do we kind of link that more economically. Well, infrastructure. And infrastructure is a gigantic issue. Yeah. So, yeah, and and that's, that's a that's processing issue. Yeah, yeah. So that, and that's you know this and this part of the project is to start this kind of discussion. I think. Yeah. Any, any other comments? I'll, I'm gonna let you guys go. If anybody wants to talk to me directly, they're welcome to do it. But I know it's uh, getting close to lunch. <clears throat> Thank you.